Hello, I'm Michelle McCory. You are watching Kitco News. As global markets are grappling with the aftermath of several big bank failures, the Federal Reserve has announced that its FedNow instant 24-7 payment network will be fully launched in July. Now, this is widely seen as laying the groundwork of facilitating a CBDC or central bank digital currency, also known as FedCoin. Now, generally speaking, a central bank digital currency is the digital form of a country's fiat currency. A CBDC is issued and regulated by a nation's monetary authority or central bank. It is programmable, so it can be modified to work or not work in certain transactions, and it allows authorities to monitor every single payment made and received, obliterating financial privacy and anonymity. Now, supporters of CBDCs claim that they will prevent money laundering, deter criminal activities, and help maintain law and order. They say that CBDCs will very importantly improve the speed and security of transactions and that they can be used to fine-tune monetary policy and allow for financial inclusion. Critics, however, warn that CBDCs are the ultimate tool of control, censorship, and surveillance. Well, like it or not, 114 countries are already in various stages of developing CBDCs, including 11 countries that have launched theirs. And here in the United States, President Joe Biden, in March of 2022, issued Executive Order 14067, which facilitates the development of digital assets, including CBDCs. In November of 2022, the New York Federal Reserve launched Project CEDAR to test a wholesale CBDC for cross-border payments. So are central bank digital currencies a way to facilitate more efficient transactions, or an Orwellian tool of oppression? And how does the FedNow payment system play into all of this, especially in the context of the recent major bank runs and failures? Well, joining me to discuss all of this and more is Richard Werner, professor of banking and economics. Richard is the author of Princess of the Yen. He is the father of the policy concept known as quantitative easing, and is an expert on central banking and central bank digital currencies. Richard has diverse experience in government, academia, and banking, including senior roles at Jardine Flemings and Bear Stearns. And he's also consulted for the Asian Development Bank, Japanese Ministry of Finance, and Bank of Japan, as well as others. Richard, very good to have you with us. Welcome to Kitco. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, Richard, we have a lot to discuss, including the FedNow system and especially what it means in the context of the current banking crisis. But before we do that, I want to get more background and basics on CBDCs in general. Now, initially, the idea was launched by the People's Bank of China. And one could say that anything that the People's Bank of China champions should be questioned. But give us the background of its inception and the basics of what a CBDC is. Right, well, I think we should start with the name uh, because, you know, there's this this name CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency, um, is clearly deployed as something that's supposed to give the impression that it's this is something new, it's technical, it, you know, it's digital, it's modern, it's the central bank is simply upgrading with a, you know, there's a new tool, it's a technical thing, don't worry too much about it. But it's a new thing. Um, that's also what this um, this name suggests. Well, how new is it? How true is this? The fact is we've been using BDC, if you want to call it that, bank digital currency, uh, for decades. It's an old thing because that's actually the money that, that we're using in our economies worldwide for, for many decades money gets transferred through the banking system. In fact, money is created and invented and put into circulation by the banks through the act of lending, credit creation, money creation. That puts the money in, into the system. Um, essentially, almost all the money we're using was originally created by banks through lending. So the money that we have, um, because you see Federal Reserve notes, paper money is only 3% of the money supply, something like that. So over 90% is bank digital currency. It's just that nobody called it that. Mm -hmm. um, 
so you can really tell that there's a, there's an intention here with this name um, to give the impression it's something new that's different. Sort of, we need to have it when really the fundamental concept is not new. We've had bank digital currency for ages, and actually, there's nothing wrong with bank digital currency. You could argue, perhaps, that the settlement by and 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 through banks has been somewhat slow. That is where you know the new um, Fed settlement system comes in, and uh, therefore the timing is suspicious. Why do they roll this out now? Why not, you know, 15 years ago um, or a decade ago? <clears throat> And of course, the banking system um, has done its job um, well in terms of making transfers uh, of funds and payments. So why do we not suddenly need to change it? What is this CBDC about? Obviously, the difference is the C, the central. Mm -hmm. What we've had so far in America has really benefited very much from is a decentralized monetary system consisting of literally thousands of banks, they're all creators of the money supply through their decision of who gets a loan, which small firm, and you, you know they're kicking the tires, they're checking the loan applications. It's a very decentralized um, structure at the heart of the economy. And now there clearly is a drive to introduce something that is far more centralized, central bank digital currency. So that's one important aspect already that goes to the heart of the issue. Do we want a centralized system, um, a centralized system with a, a central planners in charge, or do we want a decentralized system where many people make decisions and the central planners are not so powerful because there's many others that make important decisions. Um, so this centralization um, is, is a very, very important aspect um, of what's going on. And of course, there is a problem with centralization. Um, the centralization, you see, once you start centralization, it just continues. You centralize more and more and more. In fact, that's really what's already been happening for several decades in the banking system. What does it mean, centralization? Well, concentration, the number of banks yeah. actually declining. In the US, in the last 35 years, 10,000 banks have disappeared. In Europe, there's a new central bank, the European Central Bank, ECB, and it's a young central bank, only 23 years old, and yet they've succeeded in killing 5,000 banks already under their watch through their policies, and it's an official policy. They say, there's too many banks. We want fewer banks. Why? Well, they're a central bank where the central planners work, and central planners want to centralize. Now, where does this lead to? If policies continue, uh, that are not really helpful for banks. And we can come to that recent examples, you know, runs on particular banks. And what, what's the role of the central banks in this? Anyway, the number of banks will continue to decline until what is left is the central bank, only one bank. Now, we've had this before. We've had this in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is the prime example of a centralized economy with central planners in charge and you have one central bank and the central planners are most powerful and they have a central centrally planned economy now this doesn't deliver success the decentralized system it's empirically very well established is far more successful more efficient more effective and more resilient to shocks it's right. more flexible and the decisions are likely to be better if you've got a hundred thousand loan officers in thousands of banks making these small decisions, the aggregate result is going to be far superior to 10 central planners making the decision how much money to create, who to give it to. The second point, and then I'll, I'll end my, my response, um, is the CBDC also means something quite extraordinary, namely, you know, when, when you watch a play of uh, a game of uh, football, in Europe, we've got soccer, uh, anyway, there's there's always an umpire, somebody who's watching that the rules are being kept, and there's an equal level playing field, and it's a fair game. Now imagine this umpire suddenly says, well, I'm getting a bit bored here. I want to score some goals myself, and starts to run after the ball. And, oh, somebody's trying to stop it. Well, 
give the red card in soccer, the yellow card, you get off the field, I use my whistle and make the way free. Who's going to score most? Obviously, the umpire mm -hmm. will score and win the game. So umpires shouldn't join the game. Well, that's what's happening when central banks issue CBDCs. Why? Because the other thing that a central bank digital currency really is, is an account at the central bank. And retail CBDCs, which is the type that for a long time the central banks have been pushing, means that ordinary people and companies have an account at the central bank, which means they don't need the bank. So the central bank, which is the bank regulator, used to be a, an umpire, is suddenly stepping into the arena, into the into the game, is participating, is competing against the banks. That's an extraordinary development because also it immediately shows, hang on, isn't there a conflict of interest? Yeah. And with that in mind, because these plans have been around for a long time, it's not sudden, um, a sudden thing, this idea of CBDCs. We should revisit the past 10, 15, maybe 20 years of central bank policies, because if their goal is, oh, there's too many banks, we need to reduce the number of banks, and by the way, we're going to compete against banks, then maybe all their policies, monetary policies, regulatory policies, could have been affected by this conflict of interest, and maybe the policies were more or less designed to reduce the number of banks and allow the rollout of central bank digital currencies, which are, as you correctly pointed out, that's the third feature. They're not really a currency also. They're a control tool more than anything. All right. A, a lot to break down there. And I, I get you're making several points here, uh, including that perhaps this was by design for a central bank national authority to have more control over the traditional financial system. That consolidated power, as we know, is ultimately a bad thing. You want more independent players for a number of reasons, certainly one of them being economic freedom. I get that digital payments have been around for a very, very long time. I mean, who practically uses cash anymore? But let's expand on the idea of the basics of a CBDC, how it, it's potentially different because it operates on the blockchain, therefore allowing for transactions to be monitored 24-7 and sure, governments can sort of solicit or, or get the, the uh, banking details from banks, but this would give governments a direct way to see every single transaction made, every single payment made, every single payment received. So break down that idea for us, how essentially it's just a form of fiat currency, but that is on a blockchain type of platform, potentially, and that it eliminates privacy, eliminates anonymity, and could also be potentially programmable. Expand on that for us, please, Professor. Yes, well, the key aspect is really the programmability. The blockchain, in a way, is a bit of a distraction because it could be on a blockchain or not. It doesn't have to be. You have different options, and ultimately, they could even, just before launch, change our mindset, or oh, it's not going to be um, you know, distributed ledger blockchain. Um, the key thing is it's programmable. The technology is there to not just monitor every single transaction, but also to analyze this in real time and inter intervene, step in. And you can have, um, you know, very quickly um, using algorithms, AI, you know, um, ways to reshape society and um, essentially introduce a social credit system as we've uh, we've seen in China where you get rewarded for certain activities you get punished for others and the punishment will include well sorry your money is not going to work for certain transactions and the central planners will decide what's good for you what you're allowed to buy where you're allowed to buy it oh you're outside your 15 minute city um, area oh sorry your your currency your CBDC is not working anymore and you can then also even fine tune what type of things you're allowed to buy. This book is okay, but Princes of the Yen at quantumpublishers.com, well, that one, we don't want you to read and find out how central banks have been manipulating the cycles and the economy to increase their power. And so it doesn't work. You can't buy it. Right. Um, they can essentially decide 
what's going to happen in society now that is such totalitarian power um and they've said this you know they've uh, um they've said in various speeches um also at the BIS the central bank of the central banks where they've got a big project on CBDCs how this is a marvelous exciting technology that will give them so much power and so far the tools that we've had and they've had they they don't give them these powers and that's of course why they don't like cash and they don't even like bank digital currencies the bank money that we've been using because the banks have been very good they have not abused their position of power in the sense that they have not intervened to manipulate our transactions and um, they've even to my knowledge been uh, quite good about bank secrecy because we know that if you buy something on Amazon and and other you know online uh, retailers you know all of them um the information of your transactions is being used you know your searches in google and so on is being used banks have to my knowledge essentially been lagging very much behind us and have not exploited the wide array of information they have on us and our transactions um so based on this record we should rather actually trust the banks um because their history has been um less exploitative of the knowledge that that is there um and with central bank digital currency you know it is linked to central planners who love to centrally plan and intervene and tell us what to do right uh, is the idea here then professor to create a totally cashless society because you know you have called this the most totalitarian control system in human history that it is the ultimate tool of censorship and surveillance and you've given some examples now and of course as i said there's concerns about privacy there's concerns about government overreach fast forward assuming this does not get prevented and we'll talk about that in a little bit but fast forward if we fail to stop this and this does in fact get implemented what does that look like paint that picture for me cash is taken out of the system we're all forced to use central bank digital currencies how do we transact how is it distributed and and what could that mean in terms of what you call the most totalitarian control system in human history yes um of course you know the the precondition for this to be so totalitarian is as you point out to eliminate alternatives and that has been happening cash is being deemphasized in some european countries you you literally you know they don't use cash anymore uh, in china they use digital payment systems also cash is very very rare uh, in the in the big cities anyway um but the the big alternative is bank digital currency and that that's why it's so concerning to see uh, suddenly you know runs on on reasonably large um, medium sized american banks very strange because it doesn't have to happen if the regulators do their job you know then it doesn't have to um create such a um such a we don't have to see such a situation so the alternatives need to be eliminated then you have central bank digital currencies left now they say and perhaps quickly to address that oh this is good because then we can as you mentioned here we can be more efficient with monetary policy we can we can have inclusion uh, financial inclusion um we can restrict um money laundering cyber you know uh, crime and 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 things like that well actually all these problems um can be addressed with other things quite well and we don't need the central bank to be involved financial inclusion has been taken care of in in many countries in other ways and and you know if you if you if the politicians want to address this problem because that's a political question you can solve it you don't need cbdc's for that the same for you know um criminal actions well there's there are already uh, tools for that and policies the cbdc is not really needed for that this alternative so it's not convincing argument what about monetary policy well that's an example of what they what they can and will do and they've told us already when when there's only cbdc's left they say monetary policy works better why would you mean what's going to work better well sometimes it will be necessary to move interest rates very low in fact have negative interest rates okay well and if we have alternatives to cbdc's if you can put your money into cash 
then of course we can't enforce the negative rates. Why? Because what is negative rates? It just means they will take away parts of your money every month will be booked out of your account automatically. Sorry, it's a negative interest rate. It's like a tax. It's like taking your money. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you know, if you have cash as an alternative, well, thank you. I'm, you know, I'm going to move all the money into cash is what people sensibly will do. That's why they, they don't want these alternatives so they can just take your money. Now, this is just the beginning because the real um, totalitarian aspect comes into it when the programmability is used where it can be totally fine-tuned down to the person and in real time influence our behavior by restricting us from doing certain things and allowing us to do only other things. Or whenever you use money, you know, essentially from now on, once you've got CBDC as the only option, you'll need the permission of the central planners. But is this the United States of America? Where is the freedom? I need to ask a central planner, bureaucrat, how to spend my money? Well, that's the other thing, because they want your money to be in an account with a central bank. And you know, the legality of this is once you put your money with the central bank and the central bank issues your CBDC, legally, they own the money. They have the money. Legally, you don't even own it anymore. You have a claim. But sadly, this claim is subject to a number of conditions. That is the programmability. And so right. maybe if they like and agree, they will let you spend on this occasion. If you're in the right place and you're buying the right thing and haven't used up your carbon credits or whatever scheme they want to enforce. Right. And Professor, you know, people hear this and they go, oh, that sounds crazy. The government isn't going to tell you what you can and cannot buy or pay for. But we saw COVID just to the extent of how government overreach can go. I mean, we had certain countries, certain places in the world imposing curfews. People weren't allowed to leave their house after certain times. If you have a programmable digital currency, well, guess what? It just doesn't work after a certain time period. We had certain countries impose what are essential goods to buy. A programmable digital currency will just be programmed to not work to buy certain goods that the government doesn't seem to be essential at that time. And of course, we saw the example of how this could curtail freedom of expression and protests with the truckers exactly. in Canada. We had the exactly. Freedom Convoy, the truckers who were protesting against the vaccine. A whole other issue, whether or not you're for or against the vaccine, but here are people wanting to express their opinion. And we had the government of Justin Trudeau effectively issue an emergency law telling the banks that they have to take these people out of the system. It still required some coordination with a bank, but with a programmable digital currency, you can do it just like that. Exactly. And there's also, of course, the threat that people know that this could be done, so that forces people to behave accordingly for fear of being taken out of the system. Yeah. Exactly. Precisely. Now, you said the word they several times in, in your answer there. Who is the they of which you speak? Well, I was, I was quite specifically referring to the central planners. Okay. And essentially, it's well known in, uh, for example, in, in political science, um, there is a, there's a so-called theory of bureaucracy. What happens when you establish a bureaucracy that has certain powers, for example, to issue permits and licenses and authorize, and they have powers to intervene in the economy and society? Well, we know human nature and we have a, a long track record in history of what happens and it's always the same. So the theory of bureaucracy says that bureaucracies, even maybe they start out with the good intentions and you attract people to work there with good intentions for the benefit of society. But ultimately, the pressures are on, you're in a hierarchy and they're, they're following the logic of their organization. Ultimately, the goal will become just to increase the power of that bureaucracy. And that's always the tendency. Now put that together with the power of money and the power that control over money gives you. And you have a central planning, central bank bureaucracy. And so I was referring to these central planners. Um, and they're, they're, they're only human. And that means they're subject to the temptations that all humans are subject to when they're given too much power, which is why decentralized systems historically have been superior 
because mm-hmm. mostly humans can't handle too much power. Lord Acton says, power corrupts, absolute power, absolute power corrupts, corrupts absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, Professor. Before I break down a couple of other issues, I, just on the pragmatic side of things, I mean, wouldn't something like this be more susceptible to cyber attacks potentially? And you know, what happens to a digital currency if we are completely cashless and we are completely digital when, when the power goes down? Exactly. And these are some of the weakness and flaws in their arguments. And essentially, they've just come up with the the longest possible list of reasons why we need this. But almost on every single point, you can show that we no, we don't need it. There are alternatives. There's some more resilient, some better, some superior alternatives, usually decentralized and not relying so much on a particular, quite narrow and sophisticated technology. Because we know the more complex systems get the easier actually they are to break down. And the, the, you know, just to give an example, what if there is, as you say, the cyber tra- uh, attack, or we just have a, a power failure, which is now not really out of the extraordinary in some countries, yeah. in Europe even, um, you know, some are running out of energy and, and these things do happen. Well, sorry, then nothing works because you do need electricity for the system to work. And that is, not even mentioning the possibility of various software problems and errors that uh, you know and um, and um, you know the software we use in our computers i mean the one uh, the ones that i'm using are very very faulty and to then actually have to rely on this for crucial and really necessary functions always is a concern you're increasing the vulnerability for sure, a, a number of points of vulnerability, especially as the world is grappling with an energy crisis, many would say a self-imposed energy crisis in certain parts of the world. But nonetheless, there is rising incidences of power outages, which sort of negates much of the argument of the efficiency of a digital currency. I want to discuss the Fed now idea before we talk about how this is being perceived in the United States and what can be done about it. Because as I say, we're in the middle of this banking crisis and the Fed says that it's ready to launch its Fed Now system, um, which shares goals with CBDC. It doesn't use cryptocurrency or distributed ledger technology, but it has been advanced as a complement, if you will, to central bank digital currencies. And many are saying that this is a precursor, that this will precede a CBDC. So firstly, help us understand what FedNow is exactly. Um, Well, it is a settlement system for transactions, for financial transactions that is offered by the Fed and run by the Fed. In that sense, it's not really new either, because in other countries we have these systems already run by the central banks, and they've been in place for a long time. Um, and there have been no issues. So it is possible to have the system and it it can run smoothly and doesn't need to be a cause for concern and can increase speed of settlement and things like that. What is concerning is that we know that this has not been introduced so far in the United States. And why is it just rolled out right now uh, at a time when we do have concerns about the intentions of the central planners because they have told us about those intentions. Um, And central planners at the central banks have said, oh, banks, there are too many banks. And well, you know, we need to improve the system by having more centralization. Well, that together with this introduction now is somewhat suspicious. And I think that is really this, actually the underlying reason why we have still worries about the banking system at the moment in the US. Once, if you have the central bank on your side as a bank and in general, the banking system, then it's rare that you have bank runs. But I think what people have realized is, well, hang on, there's a conflict of interest. You know, the the central bankers want to compete against banks. So we can't really trust them anymore to really take the benevolent you know, policies that are good for society and create stability, um, maybe there's a different agenda. Maybe it's all about rolling out their central bank digital currency. And you see, that's why um, this is, you know, 
a genuine concern. And really, the central planners, they, the burden is on them to demonstrate um, that they, you know, they actually have everyone's um, benefit and and welfare at heart. We haven't seen much evidence of that. Look, many are saying that the timing is very, very curious. We've had a slew of bank failures in the U.S., Silvergate, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, uh, liquidated hundreds of billions of dollars in assets in Europe, Credit Suisse, given a $54 billion credit line from the Swiss government to shore up its banking operations. We're seeing consolidation in the traditional banking system, which, as we discussed earlier in this interview, is not a good thing, not a good thing for a number of reasons, certainly economic freedom being one of them. And some have speculated that these ongoing crises will be exploited to bring about CBDCs. Nick Carter, who's the general partner at Castle Island Ventures, a big VC firm, which was an early investor in BlockFi and Bitwise, who's very vocal about these things, he tweeted out, the political case for CBDCs became much, much stronger this weekend. The issue with CBDCs was always disintermediating commercial banks, but now that no one trusts commercial banks, dot, 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 dot. So I, th I think the implication is that since people don't trust their money with the banks, perhaps they'll be more open to this idea of a CBDC and money in their CBDC digital wallet. And this could be a way to sort of manipulate perception of this issue. What do you make of Nick Carter's assessment or views there? Well, there's no doubt that this is how many people will see it. Uh, we can't trust the banks. And, oh, what alternatives are there? Oh, the central bank is offering this very good. But at the same time, more and more people are realizing, as I'm sure he is, that this is intentional. Now, already 23 years ago, I warned about what I called regulatory moral hazard, or also alternative called a central bank risk, the risk that the central planners, the regulators of the banking system, have a different agenda because we've always rewarded them for each failure, for each crisis, by giving them more powers. And literally, you can go back to any major crisis, financial crisis, in the aftermath, the story is always, well, it's too bad this happened, and obviously, we need more powers to prevent this next time. <laughs> they say this each time. And each time we give them more powers, literally, more power to make decisions, interfere. Um, and um, it's been quite dramatic in Europe. The ECB has become even more powerful, already was the most powerful central bank and in terms of you know lack of accountability and so on. Um, and so it's this regulatory moral hazard that, so I want, as a result, we're likely to see more and more crises because the key decision makers who could stop and prevent that, they benefit. They just get more power each time from each crisis. But you said that this is intentional. I mean, that's a pretty big statement. Intentional by design or intentional as a byproduct of not the best thought out policies. What exactly do you mean by this was intentional? Well, what I said is um, it looks like it could be intentional and market players, some are saying it's intentional. Now, whether it is or not, we have to see in each case, but certainly the suspicion is out there and there's plenty of people uh, tweeting that, hang on, you know, why are they doing this? Where was the Fed when, you know, $48 billion in deposits were withdrawn from Silicon Valley Bank uh, Thursday a week ago. So you're saying intentionally designed to bring down uh, some of these big players, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, second largest bank in the United States, intentionally intended to create then lack of confidence and a run on other banks, which then goes well, to consolidate the, the system. Well, I like any policy maker, yeah. any policy maker that um, makes policies. Um, you know, the presumption has to be that whatever policy they're actually taking is intentional. That is the presumption. I'm not the only one presuming this um, in, in, in many cases. I mean, presumably, when the Federal Reserve makes a decision about action or inaction, it is due to um, analysis of the situation and rational action based on that within their powers and legal framework. That is called intention. 
I mean, do you think that the Fed is constantly, you know, um, has got their, their eyes blind and they're running around like a headless chicken? Um, is that uh, really the pattern? Well, actually, the pattern is quite a consistent pattern over a long time period. There's actually, it's, there's an approach in economics um, started by Paul Samuelson, one of the most famous economists. Um, in the last half century, he called it revealed preference. He said, and applied to central banks, paraphrase, this means don't really listen to what they say, watch mm. what they do. Their actions tell them, tell you, their actions tell us what their real intentions are because, right. you know, what they're doing, that is what they want to do, particularly when they're powerful and they have a choice of actions. Clearly, the burden of proof is on them to show them, you know, what they're doing was an accident or something. Well, you know, they say by their actions, you shall know them. But at the same time, and again, just to play devil's advocate here, there is also the expression, don't attribute to malice what can be explained by stupidity or inefficiency. So is yes, this well, again we all know by design? That central banks are among the smartest people in the world. Okay. <laughs> so this isn't... they. In your mind, they don't know what they're doing. They're doing well, this in no, I think, intention. No, I, I, I will always give each person the benefit of the doubt. And, and I've met really, literally, very smart central bankers. And, and mostly um, the majority of staff at central banks are actually very well in, intentioned. But they are organizations and bureaucracies. And each individual has restrictions of what they can do. And even though right. the majority of individuals will do whatever, if they can, Will do whatever's best for the for the U.S. in America. The trouble is, there's a limit. They have a boss. The boss has a boss. There is a structure, the policies, and it's an organization. So um, within these restrictions, the result may be quite different from the individual intentions of a lot of the very well-meaning staff. And but we've seen this in many organizations. You know, that's nothing right. new. All right, Professor, I know we're running out of time here, but we have to address this very important issue before we let you go, and that is whether this is in fact inevitable or if this can still be stopped. Now, Fed Chair Jerome Powell says that they're still exploring the idea that it could take years until officials decide to implement a central bank digital currency. There does seem to be consensus that this, at the very least, would require congressional approval. Now, because CBDCs could be used as tools of surveillance and control, thankfully, there is some pushback against this. House Majority Whip Tom Emmer has introduced the CBDC Anti-Surveillance State Act, which would ensure that any digital version of the dollar must uphold our American values of privacy, individual sovereignty, and free market competitiveness, as he puts it. And Representative Emmer is pushing for oversight over the Fed. He wants to prevent central bank digital currencies being issued directly to individuals, which he says would erode Americans' rights to financial privacy. And he's rightly concerned. He's rightly concerned that this opens the door to the development of what he calls a dangerous surveillance tool. Representative Hill, one of the co-sponsors of the bill, says that the government cannot and does not have the authority to issue a CBDC directly to individuals without explicit congressional approval. And he says that he, quote, aims to protect the financial privacy of individuals, their civil liberties, and stop efforts of federal overreach to surveil Americans. So it's reassuring to me, at least, that there is awareness, that there is pushback. Can this CBDC idea still be thwarted, and if so, how? No, I think it's uh, it's a good idea, um, and it's good to get politicians involved. They should be involved, uh, because in many countries, the trouble has been that uh, it's considered a very technical issue. CBDCs, you know, it's a technical thing. Let the experts do it. That's how central banks, central planners, have been um, trying to position themselves for, for decades already with whatever they're doing. Oh, you know, this is technical. You don't have a PhD in, in economics, which is not really that helpful to understand what they're doing very often, by the way. <laughs> uh, but you can't join the conversation. Sorry, you're not an expert. That's how they, they do it. That's how they like to do it. Um, so it's really important that we go out and the public needs to discuss this. It needs to become a big topic 
for general conversation, perhaps in the context of all the restriction we've seen in the last three years. And a lot of people have woken up, well, hang on, this is a bit odd. You know, so many unnecessary restrictions with very strange logic and contradictory logic, um, what's going on here? And this is a key example. And by the way, of course, in March 2020, many central banks immediately stepped up while a, a COVID pandemic was declared. They stepped up their argument that we need to push for digital IDs. And it was linked to, of course, some kind of um, vaccination passport system and things like that. Uh, but the real aim was digital ID, which you need for your CBDC. See? So there is a link in terms of the timing. Um, and we should get our politicians involved. Everyone should write to their local politician, to their local representative, um, to their senators, um, to get involved in this debate. This is somewhat un-American. This, this is in the Soviet Union. You'd, you'd probably think, yeah, OK, or China. You know, we're, this is sort of what we know from regimes where there is a, a lack of individual freedom um, at times. But it's not really very American. And uh, of course, you could say, well, but they won't use these powers. Yes, probably a first generation will be much more well-meaning and maybe they won't use it. But how do we know the next generation? By that time, some shocks happen, some crises, some other crises yeah. happen. And suddenly, I'm sorry, but it's necessary for your protection, for your good, that we're going to use this in a much more totalitarian way. I mean, you can just see how it's panning out. Yeah, once uh, the toothpaste is out of the tube, it's very hard to put it back into the tube and control how it would be used and administered and that uh, politicians will be responsible in using this. Professor, I know we're out of time. We have a lot more that we want to discuss with you, so we will have you back on Kitco News very, very soon to unpack more of these issues, including where the various currencies are in stages of development around the world. We'll have to have you back on to chat about that and also whether the U.S. can not go along with this if the rest of the world does. But for now, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it, Professor Richard Werner. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Michelle. It's been a pleasure. I hope thank to see you. you soon. All right, you can count on it. And thank, thank you. you for watching Kitco News. I'm Michelle McCory. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to subscribe. We'll see you soon.